Thanks, Steve. And yes, he's absolutely right. I am Sean Powers. And today we're going to talk about how to transition your team or your environment to a DevOps world. This actually is a picture of me, although admittedly, I think it uses some sort of like business casual Instagram filter because in real life, I'm usually wearing a little bit sillier shirts, being far less serious. Uh, but nonetheless, I really am serious about DevOps. And a lot of people don't even really understand what DevOps is. And it's not that DevOps is a new concept. It's that DevOps is just confusing, right? It's been around for a long time. You can look in job sites and say, what is DevOps? You know, and people are wanted in the DevOps world. But knowing what that means is hard, not only because it's complicated, but because they could mean different things. It's actually the merging of two different worlds, right? We have the world of development and we have the world of operations usually when i'm thinking of ops i think of a traditional sysadmin now there's probably more to it than that but in my head that's kind of how it goes and dev is the traditional developer that mindset that way to approach problems using code instead of hammers and nails i guess we don't use nails much in operations but nonetheless there are some distinct differences with how problems or challenges are addressed for example a developer has good coding skills so that's kind of their bread and butter so they have well-formed code that is efficient and runs well i can tell you my background is a system admin so we have a lot of scripting hacks that we kind of do to get the job done, you know, like four loops and bash without any error correcting or any error checking at all. And it's not the great way to go, but it's kind of how we solve problems uh, when they need to be solved. Now, DevOps people have a lot of changes. I mean, they're, they're adjusting code constantly, whereas operations people really like stability. Change is something that's going to introduce instability or problems, so we avoid that as much as possible. I did put an asterisk on both of these though, because it's not that DevOps people like constant change and don't like stability. Obviously, the changes are generally to increase the stability on their code, and it's not that operations people like old code and they don't want new features. Uh, it's just the way that we approach how to implement solutions or applications that sort of a thing so these are generalizations these are not you know exact bullet points for what it means to be a developer or an operations person uh generally in a work environment where dev and ops are working together uh the people in operations often or i'm sorry the people in development often have a waiting list as they're waiting for the operations people to get around to like spinning up a server or installing the hardware or setting up the network that they need. So there's a lot of waiting. Some people are waiting for stuff to happen. Some people are waiting for the time to do stuff. And sometimes those roles are switched as well. But here's the deal. This is the same regardless of your background. We need automation because automation is going to allow us to do all of those other things using our inherent skills rather than wasting time doing the same things over and over. So if we can automate things using software, specifically for this webinar, <laughs> DevOps software, it's going to allow us to be more innovative. It's going to allow us to have more stable code because a lot of the things that keep us from doing our job are gonna be automated away by software. Now there are a lot of challenges when it comes to implementing a DevOps way of doing things in your environment. And if you're at the point now where, yes, I know what DevOps is and I really wanna do DevOps, but it's really difficult because people don't get along. Well, you're not alone. That's kind of par for the course when it comes to implementing DevOps for a number of reasons. One, using DevOps in production, you know, using a, an operations people and development people and expecting them to merge together into this DevOps world requires an incredible amount of trust. Because what are we doing? Our developers are giving up some of their their coding stuff to operations people who are going to use their code to automate their process. And for the operators, and I can, again, tell you that's my background. So I can say it's really, it really requires a lot of trust to say, okay, developers, I'm going to give you the keys to the kingdom, so to speak, because, and, you know, give you the ability to spin up servers without even talking to me first, right? It doesn't have to be like full production servers that they're spinning up, but there's a level of trust that, it, I mean, trust is hard to build, right? And it takes building over time. Another thing is empathy. 
If you don't have an understanding of what the other side of the fence, so to speak, is going through, like, why is it those operations guys just refuse to spin up a new server for me? All I need is a new server. Well, the operations guys were like, oh, my goodness, I still have to patch the 18 servers that are in, you know, in production right now. If I spin up another one, that's going to be, you know, I'm going to miss my kid's softball game again. So it's really important to have empathy going both ways because also the operations person is, is thinking, you know what, this has been good for, you know, three months. Why do I have to keep updating it when the developer is like, you know what, I can't implement this new code efficiency algorithm without an updated server. So there needs to be empathy going both ways. Uh, there's a lot of worry. Uh, there's a lot of worry that something is going to go wrong and I'm going to get blamed for something I didn't do. Or people are going to say, why did you let that happen? So worry, trust, empathy, it's really, you can see all of these things are working together. Um, ability here. So we're talking about ability. I, as a dev or as not a developer, as somebody who's been in operations or system administration my whole career, I can tell you that it's really difficult to get into the DevOps coding stuff, right? It may be a melding of the two worlds, but it's development, it's code that's going to do that automation. So this ability or lack of ability causes fear, and fear causes implementation struggle, implementation struggles along the way. And of course, efficiency. This is one that we fall into when we're super, super excited. It's easy to say, you know what? We should automate everything. Everything is DevOps. All the ops people, all the developers, you're now all DevOps. Work together and be happy. The problem is, sometimes it's not efficient to start over from scratch doing everything with DevOps. Sometimes it's less efficient to code things. If all you need to do is spin up a server for an event or something, it might be easier to just do it manually. So you really have to think through, is using DevOps in this particular situation, is it going to be a, an efficient way of using resources? And so it's a long path up to success and success is gonna look different in every single environment. It's going to be different levels of implement, implementation. There's gonna be some things that DevOps doesn't handle. There's gonna be just, it's always going to be different. So I can't give you a clear step-by-step -step what you need to do to implement DevOps because you have to have a vision of what a successful DevOps implementation is going to look like. I do want you to notice, though, almost every one of these uh, hurdles along the way, so to speak, really requires communication. Because communication is key if we're ever going to get two very different departments to merge together and work together uh, to be better than the sum of their parts. And the best way to go about starting a process like this is really to start small. Okay, we need to start very small so that we're not completely uprooting our whole environment. We need to start small doing simple things like, let's say you're coming from the sysadmin uh, operation side. Maybe when you spin up a new server, rather than doing it the old traditional way, maybe just the new server, not, not going back and changing all of your old servers, but maybe the new server you spin up using DevOps tools just to get used to that process of coding your way to a server being up. So maybe a new system deployment is the way that you can start using DevOps. Or maybe your servers, which have been in you know production for a long time or you know whatever stage of production they are, testing, dev, et cetera, et cetera, maybe rather than going one by one and installing updates, maybe you say, you know what, maybe I can automate this process by typing out the instructions one time and making them uniform across all of my servers. I'm not necessarily spinning new stuff up. I'm not deploying applications. Maybe something simple like installing updates consistently across my existing platform. Um, maybe it's, you know, you could start brand new by saying, you know what, developers, we really want to work together. We want to communicate really well. So what if we spin off a new dev environment, and that is where we start. Maybe we start the process of DevOps using the dev environment, like that playground, so to speak, where raw code is tested and it breaks. Because if it breaks, it's not going to affect the production environment. You know, our users aren't going to say, oh, I see they switched to Chef because now nothing works or whatever. Like, you know, that sort of a thing isn't going to happen. So maybe you start in the dev department that is less visible to your end users, and it will force your ops department and your uh, developers to work together to communicate to make sure that the dev environment is spun up and updated and maintained properly. Right? If you're from the developer side, 
I'll freely admit I have less experience coming from the developer side because my background is sysadmin, although I've learned a lot of development over the past couple years. So some things make more sense as I communicate more and more with developers. Uh, maybe as a developer, you could manage your own local environment. The DevOps tools are amazing for spinning up your own, like using Vagrant or other VMs or a Docker instance or something. Maybe you completely code your own hardware and software environment personally, like even on your laptop or your, your workstation, and you do that using DevOps tools as a way to understand what the ops guys and the sysadmin guys are talking about. If you start managing your own local dev environment, you're going to see why the, the ops people are like, oh, another update, but that's going to break this and that's going to break that. You get to understand the frustrations and why you're in that waiting list for so long to get new updates or new servers installed. Uh, maybe you include software requirements in your existing code. So as you're writing your current code, maybe start thinking about, all right, so I'm creating this web application and rather than say, hey, ops guys, I need, you know, node version this and Apache version this, maybe start writing that in your code to say, all right, I want to spin up my, my dev environments, my local dev environments, and I'm going to install all of my own packages. And then you start writing your software in that way. So when you do make that eventual transition, over here with the ops guys to create a truly DevOps environment for managing those local dev environments that now the software is already in code so you can you know eat make more easily make that switch and of course share your code I can tell you oh my goodness developer people things that you think are simple are not simple I have to google every time I write a for loop in bash so all that stuff that comes so naturally to you is not inherently the way a system administrators think so have that relationship communicate in a way that is not threatening um, and and be able to bridge that gap so that the sysadmin people can think more like developers and the developers can start thinking more in the lines of what it means from a hardware and software standpoint. Really, the process for implementing DevOps is much more about soft skills, communication, and working together than it is about the actual software or hardware implementations because it really requires a level of cooperation that we've never seen before. Because again, it used to be two separate departments that work together some places better than others but there's this gulf that is now you know we're trying to get rid of that split between the two and merge these into one department and it's there's growing pains along the way and so uh, one of the questions that we start out with is so I want to do DevOps. I want to do some configuration management. I think that's a great way to start with DevOps. You know, DevOps is a really blanket term that covers things like containers, like Docker, and and you know, uh, more specific log gathering things that can all work together. Uh, configuration management is one of the more robust portions of the DevOps world, things like Ansible, Chef, Puppet. And it's good to start thinking, okay, what is it that I want out of a configuration management package? For example, if you are a, a dev, or not a developer, if you're a sysadmin heavy or ops heavy environment, Ansible is very easy for a sysadmin guy like yours truly to get into. There's no client involved, which is just another nice bonus. It just uses SSH. It's less codey. When I'm when I'm using Ansible for automation, it feels more like I'm making configuration files than I'm making code that's going to be executed. It is still code, but it feels less codey, so to speak. Uh, then there's tools like Chef and Puppet. Now, Chef is developer heavy, right? It's Ruby code, and we're going to look at that in just a second. Um, but Chef is really popular. There's a giant ecosystem. Tons of people are using Chef, which means the community of resources out there is huge, including the commercial stuff. There's a lot of packages. There's a lot of add-ons for Chef. This can be, you know, a behemoth that really you use to manage your entire infrastructure. It's really powerful. Puppet is also as powerful. Now, I've used both Chef and Puppet. Uh, Puppet is also dev heavy. It uses a lot of code, but it felt less complicated for me and maybe that's because of my sysadmin background I don't know it's no less powerful but I found it to be slightly less complicated or slightly less complex to get started in the puppet world once you understood what was going on now coincidentally haha I have courses on all three of these <laughs> configuration management tools uh, but really 
figure out what it is you want from it. And if you are a, a sysadmin guy, Ansible is a great way to start. If you want complete automation of your entire environment, look at Chef or Puppet and just check those out. Now, what I want to show you now is how simple it is to start small using Chef. Now, I'm actually going to use the lab environment that we have um, at CBT Nuggets for managing uh, a chef environment. So what we have here is there is it's a pre-configured chef environment, uh, which isn't really difficult to do. Right? There's a lab in our course that you can actually go through and, and figure this out, or you can set it up on your own using virtual machines. But I have Chef Server installed. I have a workstation, a GUI workstation that we're on here, and then a couple nodes. Nodes are the chef terminology for the client computers that are going to utilize the chef way of doing things right so right now this chef node one over here is a computer that is just a fresh install of ubuntu server and if we look at this tab here node one.cbt i'm trying to go to see if there's a web server and you know i hit refresh up there's an unable to connect there's no web server installed on it well it's really easy to add a node to the completely configured state of having a web server installed using Chef. So I'm going to log in over here. I'm already logged into Chef Manage. This is a web-based interface to our Chef server. So we can do things like, here's node one. Uh, I want to edit the run list. Now, it's okay if, if I'm losing you a little bit on the step-by-step -step procedure. I just want to show you the power of Chef. But I'm going to take this web server recipe, which we've created. I'm going to put it in the run list for node one. So I'm going to save that run list. All right, that's really awesome. If you want to see what that cookbook is, I have it open here. It's code. Uh, this is Ruby code, but it's not too difficult to understand what's going on, even if you're not a developer. So basically, I've applied this cookbook to node one and all we have to do is over on node one we have to run chef client so to do that i'm going to just run chef client this is going to query the chef server and it's just going to install apache on our local node using one command i don't have to type anything other than chef client and even the chef client part is normally automated there's like a cron job that runs chef client regularly and it will just keep this node up to date so you can imagine how nice it is if i had 50 servers i could just add that web server recipe to all of them and as they check in they're going to install the web server everything is going to go well and they're going to keep themselves updated we check it out over here we can see success by going back over to this page hitting refresh and there we have ubuntu apache 2 is installed and all i did is apply a recipe to a node now again it's exciting because we could change this recipe have it do something else like install a new web page and then when that node checks in it's going to automatically update itself so the idea of configuration automation is an awesome example of how devops is kind of taking two different worlds the world of installing packages and uploading files and code which allows us to programmatically solve problems and put them together kind of like peanut butter and chocolate goes together to make a Reese's cup and it's you know awesome it's better than the sum of its parts same thing with DevOps it really does take the best of both worlds and make something even better now there are probably tons of questions that you would have about DevOps itself if you have any questions about DevOps or specific tools or one over another you know I am more than happy to answer those questions for you